Open up your Bibles to page 526, because that's where you'll find Psalm 98. Isaac Watts, who wrote Joy to the World, decided that he wanted to write a poem based on a bunch of the Psalms, and the poem that got turned into Joy to the World was based on Psalm 98. And so that's why we're going to read that, to see what his inspiration was for writing Joy to the World. So, Psalm 98, and that's on page 526. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. Let the whole earth shout for joy to the Lord. Be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and melodious song, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord our King. Let the sea and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it resound. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains shout for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world righteously and the peoples fairly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I was looking at joy to the world and reading over the words to the carol, I started wondering, isn't it a little bit tone deaf to be singing joy to the world right now? Last Christmas was ruined by the pandemic. This one sees floods unseasonably cold weather that's wreaking havoc with the crops, late harvests, too much rain if we're honest, rising costs of living, war in Ukraine, and just a general level of tiredness. Surely joy to the world is a bit tone deaf, and maybe we should put that one on the shelf and wait till next year when things might get better, right? Well, Let's have a look and see why Isaac Watts decided to write a song about joy and the reasons that he has. And after we've looked at that, then we can make a decision about whether we bench this carol for the year or not. The first thing we need to do as we look at this is probably figure out what joy actually means. Auntie Drinda did a great job helping us with that at the start because joy is more than just happiness. Happiness comes and goes depending on what's happening. Joy lasts longer. Lots of the definitions you can find in dictionaries and over the internet say that it's the sense of peace and happiness that comes from well-being. So when you know that you're safe and loved and secure, you feel joy no matter what's going on. I kind of like that definition. The sense of peace and pleasure that comes from well-being. So let's see what joy to the world has to teach us about where we find our well-being, where we find our peace. So the first reason that we have to be joyful according to the carol is joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let the earth receive her king. We're joyful because the king is coming. This is what it looked like when the Queen came to Australia. It's not the greatest photo I can find, but they didn't have high-res cameras back then, apparently. But you can see the Queen and her husband in the car, and they're being mobbed by supporters and fans waving their house, shouting joyfully, the Queen is here. When royalty comes to town, that's usually a good reason to be joyful. It's a good thing. But who is this king? Which king is coming? Who gets to be the king of the whole earth? This is a Christmas carol, so we can probably assume that it's talking about Jesus, right? But how do we prove that? Do we know that Jesus is king? Well, that's okay, because that's where Luke chapter 1 comes in. When the angel Gabriel 
is talking to Mary and telling her about the child that she is going to be born, he says this in verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus really is king. And not just any king, he's the king who rules on the throne of David. That doesn't mean much to us. We don't really know who David is. But to Mary and Luke, this was a big deal. This means that Jesus isn't just any king. Because way back in the book of 2 Samuel, God promised David that one of his descendants would be king forever. He would rule over God's people for eternity. And Gabriel's telling Mary, this boy, it's that king. God's promised king, God's chosen king to rule over not just his people, but the whole earth. That's why he rules on the throne of his father, David. He didn't just earn it because he got born. He earned it because God has chosen him to be king. And this means we can be joyful. It means no matter what happens, we know that someone is in charge. Jesus is always on the throne. When life seems chaotic and out of control, when we don't know what's happening, we can rest assured and be safe knowing that Jesus is king and is king forever. And that means someone is always in control, no matter what it looks like when we turn on the news. But surely this is actually only good news if we know that the king is a good king. If it's a bad king who's ruling forever, that's probably not a great thing. But one of the reasons we know that Jesus is a good king is that he was born in a stable See, Jesus came as king and wasn't secluded in an ivory tower. He's not part of the elite who have lost touch with what people are going through. And as we've learnt last week, he is God himself who has stepped down into the world to share our lives. The king of the world knows what it's like to need, to be in want, to be surrounded by sickness and death and suffering. This is not some out-of-touch king who only knows money. God himself stepped down into our world and knows exactly what it's like to be human, to experience life with all its ups, downs and roundabouts. He is a good king. And he is in control. So we can be joyful no matter what happens. Because the one who is in control understands. He knows what's going on. And he will keep us safe. But then, if you had a look and were listening as I read Psalm 98, this, come, this king is coming to do something very specific. Verse 9 of Psalm 98, we read that this king is coming to judge the earth. Why are we singing joyfully about a king coming to judge? Surely that's not a good thing. Until we read the rest of the verse where it says that he will judge the world righteously. He will judge the people fairly. We sing joyfully about judgment because we know that this judgment will be just and right and true. And we love justice. Whenever there's a court case that gets reported on the news, when an injustice is done, people are angry. But when we see the guilty punished and the innocent vindicated, we're happy. We love it when true justice is done. And when this king comes, he's coming to bring true justice. Finally, 
once and for all. There will be justice on the earth. The guilty will be punished. The innocent will be set free. This is why we can sing joyfully about this coming judgment. But let's be brutally honest with ourselves. When we think about our lives and whether they measure up to God's standards, the only judgment we can expect that is truly just is one that says guilty. We don't deserve to be declared innocent. We haven't treated God the way he deserves to be treated. We haven't treated our fellow humans the way they deserve to be treated. When true justice comes, we can't expect the verdict of innocence. But the carol reminds us, joy to the world, the Saviour reigns. The king who is coming is not just king, he is saviour. Now Isaac Watts gets this from Psalm 98 when it starts talking about God's victory. God's right arm has brought him victory. The psalmist is probably thinking back to the Exodus where God took a small group of people undeserving of anything, picked them up, took them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them out to be his people. And God did this partly to be nice to a people he had chosen to be his own, but to point us forward to a greater victory that was coming, where he takes an undeserving people scattered throughout the world and through the death and resurrection of his son at Easter, sets them free from slavery to sin and the fear of death and enables them to call him Father. And because of that, the verdict that we can expect is no longer guilty but innocent. The punishment has been paid. And Paul in the book of Romans even goes further to tell us about how we can be declared innocent and God can still be just. Talking about the cross, he says, He sent Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith. The amazing thing about God's judgment of innocent when we trust in Jesus, is that it's still perfectly just because of what God has done for us in his Son. This is why the carol sings, Joy to the world, the Saviour reigns. We can be joyful because our verdict is sure. We can know 100% that because of what God has done for us, We are forgiven. And that is a great thing. Carol also has this funny line about making the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. What's going on there? Well, to prove something means to test. So if you invent a new bulletproof vest and you want to prove that it's bulletproof, You're not going to be able to do it until you shoot it with a gun and see what happens. And so God is saying, test me. Ask me to prove my righteousness and my glory. And when we do, he points to the cross and says, there is my righteousness. There is my glory when I took an undeserving people and saved them, not because they deserve it, not because they earned it, but simply because they are mine. And so we can be joyful no matter what happens. We know our salvation is sure. We know that no matter what happens, God has fixed our biggest problem. Our relationship with him has been fixed. And so no matter what ups and downs happen in life, nothing will take that away. 
And so we sing joyfully, our well-being is assured. We can sing joy to the world. We can be full of joy no matter what happens. Jesus is king. He is in control. Jesus is saviour. He has won our freedom for us. And finally, the carol gives us one last reason to be joyful no matter the situation. And it comes from that funny line about sin and sorrows growing, thorns infesting the ground. It's a really weird verse when you think about it. Suddenly, after singing joy to the world, we're singing about thorns and sin. What's going on there? Well, do you remember the last time that thorns were mentioned in the Bible? Maybe Isaac Watts is just trying to remind us that we need to get out and weed our gardens when we get home. Well, he's not because thorns show up in all places. Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve have disobeyed God and eaten from the fruit that he commanded them not to eat from, God is speaking to Adam and he says this, The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labour all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. The thorns that the song is talking about are a result of God's curse on humankind because of our rebellion against him. So why would we sing joyfully about these thorns? Well, Isaac Watts is pointing us forward to the promise that God has given us that one day there will be no more thorns. There will be no more sin. Because Christmas isn't just a holiday to remind us when Jesus was born. It's pointing us forward to when he's going to come again. Because when he comes again, he will declare his people innocent, invite them to live with him on the new earth, and sin and the curse will be no more. We can sing joy to the world because our future is assured. No matter what happens, we know Jesus will come back. And when he does, the thorns will be dispersed. Sin will be done away with. Death, crying and pain will be forgotten. Because he is coming to undo the curse, to remove sin from the world, And so the future of the world is bright. I know plenty of people who refuse to turn on the TV news or read a newspaper because they're too depressed about what they read there. They get too anxious about the future of the world. As Christians, we don't need to be those people. We know exactly what is coming in the future. We may not know what is coming tomorrow, But God has told us one day Jesus will come back and that will be a good day. Sin and the curse will be done away with and those who trust in him will live with him on the new earth forever where God will walk amongst his people once more. This carol gives us three amazing reasons that we can be joyful even when we read the news and see nothing but bad, even when we feel distant from God and from each other, even when Christmas doesn't live up to our expectations and our family disappoints us. Jesus is king. The world is not out of control. He is in control. He is ruling the world. Jesus is saviour. Our salvation is 100% assured and nothing that happens in our family, in the world, can ever take that away from us. We can trust 
because he has won that for us. And Jesus is coming again. The future is safe in his hands. We don't need to fear tomorrow. He's got it under control. He has us in his hands and he will bring us safely to the new earth that he has promised us. This is why we can always sing joy to the world, no matter what's going on. Jesus is king. Jesus is saviour. Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your victory and we thank you for your son. And we pray that you'll help us to feel the joy that you have won for us and that we will display it to those around us no matter what is happening in the world. Amen.